Welcome to everyone in, a, in the fourth in a series of uh, Pacific Institute webinars on salty related topics. Uh, today's topic is best practices for community engagement. Um, and I'm going to hand it over now to our interpreter, Carlos, who will describe how you can uh, listen in, in either English or in Spanish to this webinar. Carlos. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I will begin with the instructions in Spanish and I will be back with the instructions in English. Muy buenos días, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Se está ofreciendo, como ven en pantalla, interpretación simultánea para este taller. Para aprovechar el servicio, solo es necesario que se desplace a la barra inferior en Zoom, donde aparecen sus controles. Ahí verá un icono de interpretación, parece un globito terráqueo, y seleccionaría Spanish o Español. Si nos está acompañando desde la aplicación móvil de Zoom, es decir, en celular, tablet, etc., presionaría primero los puntos suspensivos, más, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Por último, haga clic en Mute Original Audio o silenciar audio original para no escuchar la reunión en ambos idiomas. Good morning once again. Interpretation is being provided to and from Spanish. In the event that there are any Spanish comments, we invite all of our monolingual English speakers to take advantage of the feature. To do so, all you need to do is scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen where your meeting controls are. There you will find an interpretation icon. It looks like a little world. And you would select English as your language. Now, if you are joining through the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone, tablet, or other mobile device, you would first press more, the three dots, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Gracias and thank you. Thanks very much, Carlos. So today's webinar uh, is gonna be led and moderated by Dr. Chris Benner. Dr. Benner is the Dorothy E. Everett Global Info and Social Entrepreneurship Chair and Director of the Everett Program for Technology and Social Change and the director for uh, the Institute for Social Transformation. He's also a professor, a professor of environmental studies and sociology at UC Santa Cruz. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Benner. Um, great, well, thank you so much, Michael, and um, really thanks to you and the Pacific Institute for organizing this webinar and, and the series of, of webinars. I think it's really a great, Great service. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, my background in research is really looking a lot at community development. Uh, and that fits really well the theme of today's webinar, which is uh, best practices for community engagement. But I also want us to uh, think about that in sort of a reverse way, because often community engagement is thought about as public sector entities or other initiatives trying to reach out to communities that are affected or stakeholders in whatever process is being initiated. But I, I think it's useful to reverse that. And I think that's what we're gonna hear today from many of the panelists is thinking about community-led initiatives. What are communities working on in this case in and around the Salton Sea and the priorities and efforts that are in those uh, community-led initiatives? And from that, what are the implications for the Salton Sea Authority, for the Salton Sea Management Program, for the California Natural Resources Agency, for other public sector programs to really learn from and understand uh, the priorities and values and efforts from those community-led initiatives. And, and why is that important? Well, we might think it's important just for broad values of participation, um, but we know from a lot of research when, that when there is more equitable outcomes, more equitable situations, one, it leads to better economic outcomes. It also leads to better environmental outcomes when there's greater inequality and particularly inequality to environmental exposures. Um, overall environmental quality is worse. And there's studies that show that across the country. And we know that projects end up being better when they are designed by uh, a broader collectivity of, of people and input. And so I think what you'll hear in the presentations today is a lot of perspectives about why community-led initiatives and thinking about public accountability, as well as community engagement, um, leads to better outcomes. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'll keep this part very short and move immediately into the panelists. I'm gonna introduce each of the panelists 
um, in turn rather than all at once because many of them have uh, presentations to share and that will give them a little bit of time to share their screen. Um, they'll each have about five minutes uh, to share a bit of their work uh, and then I'll moderate a bit of a discussion amongst the, the panelists. But we really want you all in the audience to participate in the discussion. Uh, and so to do that down at the bottom of your screen is the Q&A button. And at any point in the presentations, you can put in a question there and I'll track that. Uh, and then when we particularly get to the Q&A session at the end, uh, we'll make sure to get as many of your questions uh, asked and answered as possible. And so without further ado, we're gonna start with uh, Mariela Loera is a policy advocate uh, in the Eastern Coachella Valley Office of the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Mariela has a Bachelor's of Science in Sustainability Studies from UC Riverside, as well as a Master's of Public Policy from UC Riverside. Um, and her background in environmental justice includes policy and research, youth engagement, and water justice. And at the Leadership Council, Mariela works alongside communities throughout the Eastern Coachella Valley to advocate for equity in public health and justice. So Mariela, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start the conversation by giving a very like overview brief, like 101 community outreach and engagement um, points. So again, my name is Mariela Loira, I'm on, and I'm with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, so I want to start by like really giving an overview of not just this presentation, but what community engagement looks like and start by acknowledging like community engagement is not just having a community space, but all of the parts that work not one in this like linear step of one, two, three, four, but all of these parts working together at the same time and building on each other. So community engagement not being a continuous process. And um, I put these into like four buckets, but again, it's not as clear cut as, as this, just for terms of this of this presentation. And I'll go into these in my in my slides. So one being community outreach plan. So that being like the planning before you actually go on the ground and do the community engagement itself. Another aspect of it is the community outreach. It's like, how are you gonna invite community and inform community of the spaces where they can be a part of, but also about just like what's happening in their communities. Then there's also the community space itself, which is what we generally think of, I think, when we think about community engagement. And it's like that event where you're sitting down and, and having that conversation with the public and the community members. And then you also have follow up with community. So it's like after the, the event and after the conversation, revisiting unanswered questions and revisiting um, and checking in with residents and, and seeing where they're at. And all of these, again, working together all of the time, all of these four sections. So first, planning community engagement. So this theoretically should be the first thing you do, right? But again, you, you will always be revisiting and, and changing your plan to engage with community. So some key points when doing your plan for community engagement is identifying the purpose and the goal of doing this. So knowing what do you want to learn from the community? What are gonna be your next steps? And what next steps do you want to identify with community members themselves? And then when it comes to the goal and the purpose, it's not just identifying the goal and the purpose of that specific meeting or that specific event, but also the goal and the purpose of the whole engagement process itself. So for example, if you're gonna engage community on like developing a project, right? So it's like overall your goal will be to develop that project in a way that fits community needs. But then throughout the way, when you have those individual events, it's also acknowledging the goal and purpose of that event itself. And this again can change with time. And as you learn more from community, which takes us to the next point where it's community engagement is always going to be different for for the community and the residents that you're working with. So you need to know your community, you need to know what kind of outreach works better for them, what kind of communication style works better for them, what kind of just like basic things like, like language access and, and what language are you using when talking to community. And you're gonna know in your community the more you're engaging with them. So again, this goes back to revisiting this plan all the time. So right now you might have a very, uh, when not right now, but when, you, when you're initially engaging with that community, you might have a very shallow understanding of what that community needs are when it comes to engagement. But again, as you learn more, you're going to understand that community more and your engagement is hopefully going to be better with time. 
And then lastly, when it comes to com planning community engagement, is ensuring that this plan is going to touch every single step of that development. So again, using um, the development of a project as an example, it's you're going to have to plan how to engage community from the very beginning of that, from the very initial kind of like idea of, of making that plan ideally. And then how are you going to get engaged community when it comes to funding? How are you going to engage community when it comes to permitting? So engaging them in every step of the way. Um, then community outreach itself. These points I do want to acknowledge come from um, the residents that we work with specific on the Salton Sea. So they're very specific to Salton Sea advocacy. So some feedback we have gone through our, our learning experience with community on this are um, a need for them to, for you, for when you do community engagement, to share information and do that outreach at least one month in advance for community to have a chance to better prepare themselves for that event. Um, and again, just like bringing that, that outreach out throughout that whole month. Then when it comes to the outreach material that you're using itself and the outreach material in the flyer and the social media that you're using, describe how the public will participate and influence the process. So if it's an event, describe how the public is going to be allowed to be active and engage in that space so that community can again be better prepared when they are in that space. Use appropriate language. Um, so that is like, for example, in the communities that we work with in the Eastern Coachella Valley, that would be English, Spanish, and Purepecha, right? So again, knowing your community. And then also uh, when it comes to language and appropriate language, it also applies to the jargon that you're using and the technical um, language that you're using, not just the like language itself. Um, and then another thing is when you're use when you're putting together the language and, and when you're putting together your flyer is using language that entails collaboration. So instead of saying something like come join us to as we prepare X, Y, and Z, or as we prepare the plan for this project, instead say something like come be part of the planning of X, Y, and Z. So it's the community is going to be part of the development itself. It's not we talking to community and we telling community and us telling community informing community. It's a collaborative. And so when you do flyers and do outreach, it's making that very clear that community is, is a partner with us. Um, then when it comes to the outreach form forums itself, um, use different communication platforms to, to reach different audiences. So I just have some logos here from, from different platforms community has shared with us. So we, for example, actively use WhatsApp to send reminders and to share. It, um, it's kind of like the lister that the Salton Sea Management Program has. That's just an example and other agencies have this too. But we use that for, for texting and WhatsApp um, uh, platforms. So again, for folks that don't have access maybe to email or don't use email, that's a way that we share information and updates. Then when it comes to social media, using a variety of, of platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok that will reach different demographics in each in each groups. Um, also use local news media channels, including things like the radio, television, and newspaper. Um, and, and this should also apply to Spanish um, forums. And distribute physical flyers at frequented community spaces like churches, uh, libraries, local markets, and stuff like that. And lastly, collaborate with local community-based organizations who already have this knowledge and, and understanding and community leaders themselves. The community residents are already very active in their in their communities. Then when it comes to community engagement during the event itself, these are just some major points um, that I wanted to bring up. So community voices should be prioritized in the event because that's the, the purpose of the event should be to hear from community and learn from community. Um, provide ample time for public comment and respond to that comment. Create a space for dialogue and direct input to community um, voices. Plan activities that will keep folks engaged and actively participating during the event. Very important also track all input that is being received during the meeting in a public way so that community members know where their input is going and how it's being used. It's also very important during these meetings to be honest and transparent. So if community is making questions or making comments, it's very important to be honest about what is happening, what you know, what you do not know. And if you do not know something, then be honest about how you can follow up with that or how who you can refer the community to to have an answer to that question. Um, and lastly, which is, leads me to my next slide, is follow up with residents after the event itself. So have a clear follow up process for, again, unanswered questions and unaddressed comments from the event 
and share with public in an accessible way how their input during the event will be implemented directly into project development, decision making, or whatever is happening, or whatever the goal of that is. This follow up with community is also crucial just to building that, that, that relationship with community, because if you go back to the community, you build that trust and relationship with them so they know that you know that they were there, you know that you, they know that you acknowledge their, their participation, and they know that you're following up with their concerns. And it helps to just build that relationship like any other type of relationship that you have in your life. So just to summarize again, community engagement is not one event, but it's a continuous process made up of different elements. Again, community outreach planning, community outreach itself, community, the community space where the conversation is being held, and then lastly, following up with the community and continuing that relationship development. And that's it. Thank you all. Great. Thank you so much, Mariella. And I'll just remind people in the audience, feel free to ask questions at any point in the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, the next speaker is Sylvia Paz, uh, is Executive Director of Alianza Coachelli Valley, which grew out of the Building Healthy Communities Initiative. Um, Sylvia is also Chair of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Lithium Extraction um, from the Energy Commission, really looking at the impacts of lithium in the region. Um, she has a long um, CV that is linked from the webinar uh, website, which I won't repeat, but I'll put in the chat. But um, just to lift up one thing is that um, she is a proud alumna of Coachella Valley High School, a longtime resident, and holds a BA in English from the University of San Diego and a master's in public policy from the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. Um, so Sylvia, over to you. You're muted. Yeah, there you go. I was. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Mariela, for um, laying the foundation and the framework for engagement practices. Um, let me see. How do I advance this? Oh, there we go. So, just to, um, who is Alianza? We are an alliance of different nonprofit organizations that are bringing together community members, nonprofits, and government to lead efforts for a thriving. Um, region. Um, there are um, these, so following up from the uh, practices that Mariela shared, um, it's also there, there's this um, layout of meaningful community engagement, right? And there are different um, levels of engagement or outreach um, that you can see here on the screen, obviously what we prefer um, at Alianza and what we advocate for is that we try to stay between three and five um, all the time, right? And we do recognize that there are times when um, there is a need and a call for um, informational sessions, for gathering input from the community, but the most meaningful engagement is going to come from when we are involving collaborating or deferring autonomy and decision-making to the communities that we're working with. Um, so what might meaningful engagement um, look like? Um, so following up on the um, framework that was set by Mariela, I am going to give you sort of uh, how Alianza practices this in the projects that we do. Um, so, as an example, I'm going to use our Salt and Sea Initiative, which is an initiative that started uh, about a year and a half ago when we were deep into the pandemic and realizing that all this cash assistance was gonna come to an end soon and that our communities were going to be in worse off shape than we were um, before the pandemic. Right? So we set up a partnership of um, Alianza and our community partners the Assembly Committee on Jobs, Economic Development and the Economy, the UCR Center for Social Innovation and the Institute of Social Transformation um, with Chris at UC Santa Cruz. And it was really to develop an exploration of how to realize equitable, inclusive and sustainable economic development and mobility in the Salton Sea. So while this is all exciting work, um, I'm not gonna go into it, but I'm using this at, just to demonstrate the process um, for community engagement. Um, so um, this is the approach that we took. Again, as Mariela was saying, you need to be, you need to have the long-term game in sight when you're planning for community engagement. So as we were engaging um, 
or as we were starting our salt and sea initiative, we knew that we wanted to have stakeholder um, engagement and we knew that there were going to be critical points at which we needed them. We needed them right at the beginning um, when we were doing our scoping and research so that the community members, um, business leaders, economic development practitioners, um, nonprofit partners, all had a chance to think with us as a region, what is the real question that we're asking, right? And what approach should we take um, in answering that question? So what resulted uh, from this was that not only did we refine the question, but we also um, developed uh, some understandings about how we would be checking um, the findings from the research itself, right? So we were gonna do a literature review and then it was important um, that after that um, literature review and the first framework was developed that we were gonna go back to our community members and say, does this work for this region? Um, what did we miss, right? So that's um, in our process, we identified the two key places where engagement was going to make a difference before moving on to publishing um, our results or making any recommendations. So our salt and sea initiative findings as a result of that process are relevant to our region. And um, you can see um, here, these are, um, and Chris Benner will call them indicators and inclusive um, region inclusive economy um, framework indicators. But what it was important for us was that um, we make them more action oriented so that they would become criteria, right? And that when we're looking at projects, we can say, what's the criteria for these projects? And again, making sure that they're relevant to our region and pointing out that number four and number five, and uh, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong during the Q&A question, but those were elements that this region really elevated after the original framework was created, um, when we were having um, focus group conversations. Um, and it was, of course, of no surprise, given the um, degradation of the Salton Sea in our region and the lack of infrastructure. So number four and number five, um, I believe, make um, these findings very unique and tailored to our region. Then um, our Salton Sea initiative recommendations um, then also reflect uh, community priorities. So I talked about the importance of um, having actionable sort of research, right? So um, turning indicators into criteria and then um, developing a set of recommendations that would say, what could this look like um, in real life? What might the projects, the approach to the Salton Sea look like? So the projects at the Salton Sea um, need to increase the resiliency of this EJ community through projects that invest in infrastructure that protects against climate change, that creates multimodal access to community resources, that enhances economic mobility, and advances a healthy environment, right? And all this came from listening to the communities, right? Starting from that criteria, really starting with the inclusion component, starting, okay, where is the community and how do we include them? in thinking about the solutions that are needed in the region. And then how do we um, start visualizing them? So these graphics, and again, you, we can, you can ask me more questions because this is not, um, the presentation is not the, um, it's not really about the designs, but I will point out as an example um, is that the projects at the Salton Sea need to connect the community needs, particularly the community of North Shore that currently has no access to get to the Yacht Club or access the lake unless they have a car. Um, and for pedestrians, it's really unsafe. So this concept of having a green bridge, again, that will include um, climate resiliency by adding, you know, cooling elements like vegetation, um, some habitat for the birds, um, allowing pedestrian access, so therefore increasing the safety um, and also adding some infrastructure components um, like broadband, um, which you see reflected on maybe the left side of your screen. Um, so the key points 
is that the process has the ability to determine levels of inclusivity and meaningful engagement. So determine ahead of time the key points where community involvement and input will make the difference between taking a left or a right turn. The engagement um, needs to have a clear end result. The result of the engagement needs to reflect community perspectives. And finally, the realization that we need to stop doing projects to meet a mandate or liability or to check the box that we engage community. Instead, we need to think about every project as an opportunity to improve someone's quality of life. And only when we realize the intersectionality of the issues and begin integrating ourselves as a piece of the larger puzzle that re um, requires better integration between and among agencies, and communities um, in order to complete that puzzle. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. And a lot more to dig in there in terms of the details when we get to the question and answer period, but it's great to have that presentation. And again, a reminder, you can submit questions at any point. Um, we'll turn now to Christian Rodriguez. He's a community associate at um, KDI, which he'll tell you a little bit about. KDI's uh, Coachella office. Uh, he's a proud resident of the Eastern Coachella Valley, and he works with community members on a daily basis to develop programming and to advocate for environmental justice. And I'll turn it over to you, Christian. Thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yeah, it all looks good and sounds good. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. So um, uh, as a follow-up to, to both, um, Mariela and Sylvia's presentation. I wanted to share a little bit about my organization, Kui Design Initiative, also known as KDI, and how it is that we implement some of these engagement practices and what do they look like um, as far as uh, uh, projects that that are uh, that require um, both uh, meeting codes, uh, uh, you know, having uh, specific um, uh, deliverables, but also um, what it looks like to have governmental agencies partner with communities in the decision-making process. So uh, I'll talk about KDI. Our uh, organization is, uh, a non we're a nonprofit. We do design and, uh, and we do uh, urban planning and we do this in communities that are under-resourced. And our goal is to advance um, equity and, and to activate unrealized potential uh, within these communities. Uh, Kunkui, the word Kunkui uh, means to know a place intimately. So uh, adequate and robust community engagement is at the center of our uh, work. And we believe that uh, all of this, um, uh, uh, all these social issues that are experienced in the communities that we work with are due to the lack of access. And when we talk about access, uh, we mean access to things like social infrastructure, schools, community centers, public spaces, cultural institutions, uh, also uh, access to safety, uh, safe streets, safe housing, safe public transit, and a healthy environment. Things like running water, uh, the absence of environmental hazards, uh, decent sanitation, the ability to withstand climate disasters. And uh, I'm going to um, show you uh, about uh, a project um, that we are currently working on in the Eastern Coachella Valley. And we call this our uh, Eastern Coachella Valley Productive Public Space Network. And, and what we mean by productive public space, what you see here is a recreation space, a, 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 um, uh, and, and it could be seen just as that. But what we are trying to do is to uh, co-design with the community spaces that could have multi-benefit, um, that could be uh, uh, maybe at face value, uh, one thing, but in the community and how it's designed uh, could have multiple benefits and, 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 and various um, solutions to some of the social issues. And so when we're talking about a productive public space and when we're setting out to uh, uh, work with the community, we have these three main priorities. How can the design of this space uh, involve uh, economic um, opportunity? create social capital and then also do a transformation to the landscape that is going to be a, a healthy intervention that can address uh, uh, things like like climate change and uh, and even thermal comfort um, in areas like uh, ours. This is uh, the site of the North Shore Park, which is uh, as Sylvia was mentioning, um, you know, just right across the train tracks from uh, where the Salton Sea is. 
And you can actually see on this picture of the background, the salt and sea uh, in the background. And we've been very fortunate to be working with um, several organizations. And I do wanna mention that, you know, we are part of the Alianza Coalition. Um, and so we've been fortunate enough to have partnered with several different organizations in the region um, to, to help us organize uh, uh, within the community of North Shore um, and to, and to uh, with Desert Recreation District, um, uh, develop a site that was for the community that had uh, a recreation at the forefront, but that um, would be multi-beneficial. The uh, engagement process that we uh, 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 underwent when we were developing the North Shore site, um, it went everything from site mapping. So individuals within the community were able to play uh, the role of designers and planners and, and design their ideal uh, 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 space uh, with those three priorities that I was uh, sharing. We we do a series of workshops and uh, and and to um, reference what Mariela was sharing, there is an exchange of learning that needs to happen between both the uh, technical experts, uh, which in in this particular case would be KDI, um, and the community experts which are the residents in the community that, that you're working in. And so here we see some residents that are showing us what ways uh, and, and what interventions and what a plan set up an individual site plan could look like that um, would address some of the needs within the community. We involve the community in every step of the design making, uh, the decision making process from uh, the types of uh, 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 trees, the types of um, uh, uh, colors that are being used. Um, uh, and, and in this case, uh, you're seeing there, the types of amenities that are going to be um, available within the site. All of our work also involves uh, creating a, um, a, a creating a theme within this design process, one that is reflective of community and culture. Here you're seeing a, uh, a mural that um, is currently at the site at the North Shore Park. This was a collaboration between an artist, um, uh, Carlos Ramirez, and community leaders. Um, and uh, we believe that uh, integrating uh, art, uh, integrating community voices, and, and bringing in as many opportunities for collaboration between uh, individuals, between leaders, between agencies, um, actually produces a much more successful uh, outcome. And so here is uh, what you were looking at at that initial picture um, uh, of that uh, desert landscape. This is the outcome of, of a uh, participatory process that brought the community along. Um, I, I, because of limited amount of time, I wish there was a lot more that I could share um, about some of the, of the uh, ways that we were able to in, in, implement or integrate. Uh, ways of addressing those three priorities that I was sharing with you. I'll briefly just say that um, through this uh, process, design process, we were able to engage with uh, folks within the community that were interested in leadership development. We were able to engage with a group of women um, at this site and another site um, uh, that were interested in developing a micro enterprise uh, business plan and, and helping them through that. And, uh, and, and, and just really quickly, I, I wanna share, this is what I mean about a productive public space network. Our first site um, in North Shore opened in 2018, but to make reference again to both Sylvia and Mariela's presentation, our investment within the community is not just one project and, and we're done. We're really thinking about how it is that one project with the approach of multi-beneficial, um, uh, uh, multi-benefit multi embedded into, um, into its, its design process um, can be uh, uh, leveraged to provide not only the same type of uh, project for other communities, but how we are working to build a larger social network. So now we have been working with leaders uh, and youth in North Shore. We um, did our, our uh, second, our, our, I should say our third productive public space um, over at the Oasis community, which has now uh, resulted in, in a 20 strong uh, leadership group um, and, uh, and various programs that are addressing uh, economic issues 
that are addressing transportation and mobility issues. Uh, these folks that we've been engaging, for example, in the Oasis community, um, have been involved in the designing of a, a transportation plan for Riverside County, of which uh, was awarded about $7 million for its implementation. And so um, what, what I, I, I want to, to leave you with is that you know, our, our goal is that through a meaningful engagement process, we can uh, communicate that there is a way for the community to uh, be brought in and make decisions for themselves um, and can still result in a, a project that hits all of the check marks um, and meets all of the, all of the um, uh, things that uh, that we we need to do, like designing a park, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Christian. Those are really impressive images to see. I really love seeing the projects you're working on. Um, our next speaker is Frank Ruiz. Uh, he's the Salton Sea Program Director for Audubon. Uh, he's from Coachella. He came to Audubon in 2017 with more than 13 years of experience leading nonprofit organizations, including, uh, amongst one thing, a national alliance of faith-based leaders organizing and training community stakeholders in efforts to protect the environment. So, Frank, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I kind of feel like uh, being in, the, in, a, in a holy place, you know, with uh, all the expertise and knowledge you know, of my previous colleagues, um, and uh, kudos to you all for all the work that you've done. Um, my name is Frank Ruiz, and I am the Salton Sea Program Director for Audubon. Audubon is um, an entity, it's a nonprofit that is mainly working for the betterment of uh, the birds and the wildlife. And whatnot, uh, working with the various communities, especially focusing on the communities around the Southern Sea, we understand that the communities are not a monolith. Um, rather, they are. It's a. It's a. It's a um, group of people from various cultures and languages and uh, socioeconomic uh, status and whatnot. So. This is our approach to working with communities. Uh, I do not pretend to know what the engagement is all about. I leave that to the professionals. Uh, this is how it works you know, for us. And basically has three components, right? Uh, the way we communicate, uh, the way we outreach and the way we engage. Um, and this is, you know, we do it um, in a way uh, whenever the, um, the, the occasion warrants, you know, um, each and every one of these elements, out of unintentionally conveys the Salty crisis through opeds, PSA, social media. At one point, we had twelve PSAs running with the uh, English and Spanish uh, traditional TVs. We work, you know, uh, we community members to solicit inputs related to public health recreation amenities, not just the environmental concerns. Um, and we work with the surrounding communities all around the South and see both on the end, on the South end and the North end. Uh, we engage communities through field trips, education, restoration projects, and community, community science programs. Um, and I'm gonna give a little sample of, you know, um, uh, of what, you know, it means, you know, for us, you know, to engage in each of these elements. Uh, the communications. Years ago, we launched a communication uh, campaign to inform the community. And that communication is probably the most basic uh, form of um, working with communities, but it allows us to, inf to form connections, influence decisions, and motivate people to collaborate. Uh, and with the, we launched this, uh, the South Sea crisis is real, and many of you saw the billboards, you know, all over, you know, the uh, uh, the highway, uh, you know, uh, the highway I-10, and the second part, of, you know, our work, our work with communities is, you know, the outreach, and this is, I understand that this is one way of communication. However, this tool can be incredibly helpful, especially to gather information, generate attention, and pay the way to a better relationship with the communities. Um, and a sample of that is, you know. Uh, just uh, um, a survey that we just finalized uh, engaging people from India all the way down to the border with Mexico 
understanding what what, the, what is it that the communities want? What are their priorities? So we understood a lot uh, because we do not presume that we know what people want. Like this, you know, example uh, of the areas that are commonly visited by people. Bombay is, 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 is definitely by far, you know, the most visited places followed by the South Sea, South sea Recreation Area and, and, and the rest. Uh, another sample is uh, of what is important for the community. Uh, definitely people felt that if the water quality is improved by the South Sea, they are more um, willing to engage and visit, you know, the, uh, the South Sea areas. So, this is just, you know, an example of, you know, the, uh, the, the outreach that we do. Um, obviously, outreach is just one way, but it leads, you know, to the next element, you know, that where we spend most of our time, which is engaging uh, the community and engaging for us uh, is make, just making connection, building bridges and influence, influence each other uh, in a very creative way. So how we do it? We do it uh, through education engagement. Uh, we bring a lot of high school kids over to the Southern Sea, talking about, you know, from birds to public health to economic opportunities and whatnot. And this is, we feel it, it is our, our moral responsibility to engage, educate, allow, you know, young kids to understand what is at stake right here. How can they participate? Second, we, uh, we have a program that is called Eyes on the Sea. We bring a lot of kids, you know, to understand and, and, and put their theoretical knowledge into practice, you know, to become more pragmatic in their approach, understanding that what is happening here impacts the whole region in many in various ways. Uh, we do a lot of internship uh, engagement. Engagement for us is, is more than just talking to people, right? It's, it's creating those, those spaces, you know, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, um, and we have an internship program that creates career paths that will allow them, you know, to promote uh, knowledge acquisition, to facilitate implementation of their theoretical knowledge and uh, many other opportunities, developing even their own networks. Uh, we do community engagement, the traditional, bringing different folks, you know, to the to Sound Sea, having those conversations. We engage from faith-based uh, groups to boys and girls clubs and uh, many other different groups. Um, we feel, you know, that, and this is my MO, if we want people to really care for something, they have to learn how to love it first. And they will not be able to love it unless they're exposed to it. And so we want to create the exposure. Um, another thing that we do is, you know, community engagement is, you know, we are hands-on on the restoration projects. And we have one at the south end of the Southern Sea, uh, Bombay, uh, uh, the community, very close to the community of Bombay. And, we we're looking at all the different benefits, not just the environmental benefits, not just creating habitat, but suppressing dust erosion, uh, providing um, research and education opportunities for young folks, uh, creating uh, opportunities for recreation for the communities uh, that live nearby. So so we take you know this. Uh, with all the, we tackle from all different angles. We engage various sectors. You know, we fly people over the sea. We take people hiking around the sea. This picture is, you know, with Congressman Raul Ruiz, you know, who 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 is engaged at the sea. And we wanna we wanna uh, engage all the different sectors, you know, that we have identified from faith based education, uh, um, eh, economic, you know, uh, groups and and you name it. So. I'm gonna leave you with this, you know, just quote, because I think for me, it is powerful. I can share all day about, you know, the work that we do, but you know, the, the, the purpose of, you know, this time is to, to create that space so that we can learn from each other. And I love this quote, alone, we can do so little, together, we can do so much. And this is the MO and this is the purpose. This is the intention of Autobahn um, working on the South Sea. Thank you so much, Frank. And I really appreciate that, that inspirational quote to finish the presentation. Um, our last panelist is Miguel Hernandez. He's the public affairs officer for the Salt and Sea Management Program at the California Natural Resources Agency. But he also pre previously uh, has experience as communications coordinator at Comité Civico del Valle, a community-based organization working on environmental justice issues um, in Imperial County and, and throughout the state. So Miguel, thanks for joining us today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks 
the Pacific Institute and this group for allowing me to be part of this uh, group of experts on community outreach and engagement. Um, yeah, Sera, uh, my name is Miguel Hernandez um, from Imperial County. Uh, I've been working throughout the region for uh, a few years now. Um, also, uh, I'm the public affairs officer at CNRA under the Sonsi Management Program. I uh, just wanted to mention, you know, highlight all the work that our partners on this panel have done, have actually shaped the way that the uh, Sonsi Management Program does its community outreach and engagement. Uh, there is a um, community engagement committee that has, yeah, that was put together years ago, which um, all of the folks on this panel are part of, including other, other partners, uh, such as Comité Civico, Ecomedia Compass, uh, both uh, Imperial and Riverside County are also part of this committee. And they have helped shape how we, how we go about outreach and engagement. Um, there is a, a, a document, uh, an engagement plan actually, that was put together by this group a couple of years ago that you know sets a, a a good a good guideline for how we conduct our outreach and engagement uh, throughout the region considering all the factors that you know like mariela mentioned earlier um you know cultural factors uh, plain language um language access you know all of that is, has been part of of the feedback we've received from this group and also feedback received from the public so that's the way uh the state is, it's, you know, shaping its strategy, shaping the way we are reaching out to communities, also shaping the way that how we collect their feedback, how we keep a, a record of all that, and how we eventually, uh, and to the extent that our projects can, you know, make it part of the program uh, for both, you know, there's a 10-year plan, there's also the long-range plan, um, there are all these multiple tracks within the science management program that, you know, are happening at the same time, and all this feedback that we've received for for many, many years. And, you know, just recently, you know, with that engagement plan that was put together, um, and as mentioned by Mariela also that, you know, perhaps need to be uh, revisit to make sure that we're still consistent, that we're meeting the demands of the community, that we're meeting uh, what needs to be be done out there. Um, you know, that's, that's not a, the work that has been solely, you know, relied on the state or something that the state has proposed. It's something that was, you know, collectively put together by this group. Um, and, you know, it's helping us achieve the goals that, you know, we all want to see as a, as a community. Um, you know, I, I myself, am a member of this community for my whole life and definitely want to be intentional on the work we're doing out there and how we, how we conduct our business on community outreach and engagement, how we actually bring community to the table, uh, you know, with, you know, multiple um, communities, you know, tribal communities are a key factor in all of our communities. Um, of course, being able to provide um, language access to folks that, that need it. Uh, and, you know, all of our materials go out there uh, publicly uh, in both languages, English and Spanish, uh, to the, you know, to make that space and the informational uh, pieces accessible to folks that are part of our community and even outside of our community, uh, folks that are interested about the salt and sea, how they can help us um, shape the future of the sea. You know, the team has really uh, ramped up our efforts on outreach on uh, the last year or so, a couple of years, you know, that, you know, we, we've created multiple venues and using different strategies on not just outreach, but also how we conduct our meetings. Uh, we've been relying on the engagement committee and also based on um, the recommendations we've created subgroups to help us, you know, put together this public meetings, help us um, how we conduct our meetings and, you know, identify goals, identify what is it that we want to accomplish at a particular event. Um, some of those have been just educational informational meetings, like just a report back what we've done uh, for the program. Uh, also, you know, just recently, uh, we had a, a, a community workshop where we, you know, seek for feedback on 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 the long range plan and the concepts that are out there you know perhaps you know those are a bit technical uh to explain but with the help of you know this subgroup that was you know brought in in support to the state team uh most of them or all of them are part of the uh um the, the community engagement committee so they you know they they were a, a key component in a uh, a factor that you know helped us to have a better conversation they were they were you know part of our our success there 
was that they were um, engaged from the get go when the planning process, like what is it that we wanted to do? Uh, you know, their input was incorporated and how even the presentation looked like. So that's how the state it's, it's been, you know, being upfront with them, like this is what we want to accomplish. This is the sort of, you know, public review period or this is the type of input we're looking for. And, you know, let it, letting this groups, you know, or working groups influence the work we do out there publicly, how we conduct our business with, you know, community, how we, how we do meaningful engagement, how we do um, impactful outreach as well, and how we continue to educate those folks that are, you know, uh, being brought in for, perhaps for the first time on this spaces, you know, there's, you know, all these groups that, uh, or this interest for folks to know what's really going on out there, uh, what the tenure plan even is, right, like, and, you know, all the other stuff that uh, community members are really you know, eager to know. And, and then once they um, come into these spaces, we also wanna make sure that they feel welcome, that they are prioritized, that their input is, is received and, and taken and that, you know, perhaps incorporated to the extent that our projects allow. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, um, you know, uh, there's a, a lot going on with, our, with the program, the science management program. Um, you know, we have, uh, a strong pillar, which is the community engagement plan, uh, the engagement committee. Uh, we have, you know, all of our partners that are, you know, a, a key success, key parts of su the success of the program. So, um, you know, recognizing that there is, um, of course, room for for improvement. There is also, you know, recognizing that you know the program itself, it's it's uh, behind on its acreage goals, and that we are upfront and blunt about it as well, and that we're able to explain what's really going on with our community. So. Um, yeah, I, I'll leave it at there. Um, thanks again for for the for the opportunity, and definitely look forward for a good conversation. And, and thank you all again for this invitation. Great, thank you so much for that input, Miguel. And I'll invite um, all of our panelists to turn your videos back on, um, and we can jump into a bit of a, a conversation. And again, a reminder to those of you in the audience: we'd uh, love to see your questions, and we'll try and get to them as well. Um, just put them in the Q and A button at the bottom of your your screen. Um, I, I want to start with a question that was sparked for me by Mariella's comments. And Mariella, Mariella, I really appreciated you describing the whole continuous process, um, that it's not just a point in time, but it's a set of really relationship building that goes on. And you didn't emphasize this word very much, but part of what I heard you say was it's about building trust as part of those relationships. And, and I wanted your perspective and maybe others as well as examples of what undermines trust? What are the, the landmines, the particular things to watch out for, to avoid in trying to do effective relationship building? Yeah, I think one, one really big one is lack of transparency when it comes to like responding to questions. And that's why I wanted to emphasize it as part of the space. So if, commun if community is hearing something from like decision makers during a community event, but then when it comes to action and decision making, that's not happening and they're not following up with whatever they're saying, then that doesn't, that breaks trust, right? Because it's better to tell community something that is true that some, than something that you think community wants to hear and then not follow up with it or it then not being true. Um, so just being really, really honest um, because community also knows Right, communities like especially community leaders who are already engaged in the space, like they know, and so that that breaks um, trust. I mean, think uh, the way that I like to to compare it to is like any other relationship that you have in your life with, like your mom, your friends, like whatever, right? Like your like partner. Um, if you lie to them, then that breaks trust, and it's hard to bring back trust. And that's I think something to highlight. It's like once think about again your relationship when they lie to you it's hard to build that trust again than when they're just honest with you from the very beginning right so very corny but you know just think yeah. about it like any other relationship well and i want to see if anyone else wants to answer that question while also bringing in um, a question from jerry in the audience which i think directly relates to what you're saying where you're saying honesty and transparency is critically important but we all know that there are examples of misinformation that gets spread 
um, by different people and different agencies? And, and how do you address misinformation? Sylvia, I see you've been. Yeah, that was, I mean, what Mariela said was the first thing that came to my mind, the transparency and also related to that, or maybe sometimes even as a result of that, you know, there is that misinformation and um, the, unfortunately the messaging on misinformation, it's so much quicker and um, to comprehend the language is there. So that spreads a lot faster then we have the time to put the information um, out there or to even prioritize. Um, so it is, it ends up being a very uh, time consuming process. Um, so I agree with starting from the get go with the transparency and, um, you know, acknowledging that if decisions have already been made, having that conversation, right? It's like, look, this is a moving train and we recognize that we're just engaging you at this point that put in our viewpoint, right? As the proponent of whatever project it is, the answer is not an yes or no. Maybe the answer is when, right? And, and maybe there's a how, and we can work on that, but I think there's, um, we don't have a practice, the institutions don't have a practice of having that type of transparent conversation with the community from the get go. And it just um, models the process as we go. That makes a lot of sense. And you also mentioned the importance of, of time, that it can take time to build those relationships and, uh, a commitment to being there for the long term, I think is really important in that. I, I wanted to ask another question. Sorry, Miguel, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, regarding building that trust. Um, and again, mentioning that the engagement committee is a key pillar to, to the to the Sons management program. Uh, for us to, you know, be able to partner with them uh, in this group here, and then, then be the messengers, the trusted messenger that brings, you know, this information that is in constant uh, communication with the state or the Sonsi management program allows us to, you know, bring folks to their spaces and perhaps become more familiar with their, you know, trust that, you know, they're walking into a space that um, it's conducive of community uh, input. It's also that, you know, uh, they are the ones bringing them uh, or helping us bring them to this, to this meeting, not only to listen, but also to be part of uh, the multiple processes that are happening in the Sonsi management program. Um, Sylvia, you raised a point, I really appreciated it, about um, participation, uh, well, the, the spectrum of participation and acknowledging that there are some times when processes of information sharing are appropriate, but you're really trying to get, in most cases, to a, a deeper level of participation that involves collaboration or really deferring to more democratic or community-driven processes. But there's another dimension of that as well, which is participation in processes that are consequential, that um, make a difference in people's lives. And you know, you can have very meaningful participation about a very small thing, um, but then there's also huge questions in the Salton Sea. You know, water importation and potential billions of dollars that might be spent on infrastructure for that versus maybe those resources going for dust mitigation or, or environmental regeneration or, you know, the whole questions about uh, lithium and lithium development in the region where, you know, private companies and very powerful multi-billion dollar agencies are getting involved now in the Salton Sea in ways that haven't happened previously. And so I'd love to hear you reflect a little bit on community voice and spaces in those um, places that have major consequence for the region, but are often shut off from community voices? Yeah, well, that's a, a, a huge question, um, loaded question, I think, um, Chris, for me, because one, I am a community member, right? And people sometimes fail to see that because I also have privileged um, in so many ways that I get to occupy being the chair of the engagement committee for CNRA being the chair of the lithium committee. Um, and I think there's um, sort of a lot of times like guilt by association 
um, and how is it that we um, how do we realize right that there are contexts and it's not an excuse but there is a context for most of these decisions on these spaces that are not visible for everyone and um, that it um, makes the work so much more complicated. And I'll give some examples. So for example, in my experience with the uh, chairing the engagement committee, right? Yes, you have willing a willing agency that creates a committee and that already opens up access, but you still have this institutionalized way of doing things. So my job, both as a community member and now chairing is like, trying to continue to push and ask the question then ask the state, well, why can we do this or why not? And there's a whole lot of process, um, institutional process and then a lot of times maybe institutional barriers um, that keep things working the way that they are. So we have um, some work to do in that. And sometimes the complexity of the issues like with the salt and sea, for example, um, some of us in this group, when we were putting together that, um, that those guidelines for community engagement, we continued um, asking um, the state if they could identify sort of that timeline, right, of the approach that I used in my example. It's like, when are the key moments, right? Like, can you give us a timeline of the projects, what stage they are in, and when are the key moments when it will make a difference um, for the community to influence, right? Or to say, okay, is the state gonna go left? Is it gonna go right? Is it gonna keep going straight? Um, and a lot of times, either because of lack of capacity at the time or just how quickly the pressure to move quickly, um, we, th those guidelines were not, and to this day, I mean, I haven't seen them, and, but I haven't been in that space in a while. Um, as well. So it is a very, like I said, a very um, loaded question, but there is, um, there is a willingness. I see a lot of the language in many, um, you know, funding sources, applications, work around the salt and sea, this emphasis on equity plans and community access. So I think all of that is a step in the right direction, um, but it's going to be a slow, transition for people who have been in those institutions for a very, very long time to be able to transition into well, what does this look like now? How do we operationalize on all these equity uh, concepts that we're now um, instituting into policy? Yeah, I appreciate that. There's so much wisdom in what you're saying. Um, Marielle, I know you have things to say about this issue of consequential spaces too. Uh, well, not directly answering the question, but I also wanted to highlight when it comes to planning and um, something Sylvia brought up too, it's like just the institutions that we work with and the bureaucracy behind it all and acknowledging how long it takes to, to like get things implemented and on the ground. And with working, when working with community, it's very important to, to acknowledge that at the very beginning and have a plan as to how are you gonna engage community and let them know this is gonna be a long process so that they don't lose interest or they like lose hope and then therefore also lose trust, right? So, so just acknowledging bureaucracy and how all of this works and having that conversation with community as well. Yeah, yeah. what you both emphasize, I think is really important in um, the time factor of this too, knowing when the critical decision points are happening and how to be involved in that. And, and the difference between formal structures and words and then real cultures and, and practices as well. Christian, I see your hand there to comment on this as well. Yeah, something that I just wanted to add is also, um, you know, going back to the idea of trust and, and, and what we're talking about now is to also be very upfront about all the benefits, all the people that are gonna benefit from being involved in its various ways. And that ultimately everyone on this panel is this is your job, this is your career, you're getting paid to be here. Community doesn't get paid to show up to these meetings unless we make the opportunity for community to get paid to be in those meetings. And so for me, I think the one thing that we always need to put at the forefront is that there is a soft spot. There is a soft spot for private industry uh, to benefit. There is a soft spot for uh, a government to benefit. There is a definitely a soft spot for community to benefit. And I think unless we're talking about 
that there is a lot of money to be made, that there is a lot of benefit, both careers, uh, 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 companies, and how is this going to be also, uh, how is the community, the, the community that is going to be living with whatever it is that we do, whatever project it is that we're presenting, how is that community going to also be uh, um, getting some of that benefit? And I think we don't talk about that enough. And, and that to me is sort of that line of transparency, that trust that you're creating with community. You know, I, I personally, I always go to community and I say, look, you're meeting with me here at 6 p.m., but this is my job. I'm getting paid to be here. So your effort, your involvement is much more valuable than any sort of expertise or any sort of ideas that I'm bringing to the table. So what you are doing is much more important and everything should be geared towards uplifting you who are doing this out of your own individual interest. And so just to go back to what Sylvia was saying, you know, it's very difficult. I think most of us sort of play this two, two hats, right? We're community, we want to see this, we're, we're longtime residents, and, and we, we have a very personal investment. Also, this is our job. This is our, you know, nine to five. And so, and so it, it, it does, it, I think there is a, a, a place where we come back to the community and say, look, all of these things, although historically have left communities like you out of the decision-making process, here is an opportunity for you to shape how it is that these types of projects, that these types of uh, investments will be giving everyone what they're looking for and, and more so than not to this community that has historically been left out um, of, the, of the piece of the pie. Yeah, I really appreciate those comments and paying attention to the resources it takes for meaningful community partnership. That's, it pays off in the long run um, and often the short run, but it takes an investment. Appreciate it. You know, you raised another issue in your comments, Christian, that I wanted to follow up with with others too, because Miguel, it was echoed in some of your comments about, Christian, you used the term technical experts and community experts. And that touches on a broader set of issues of the challenges of communicating across, you know, some of the complex issues that the Salton Sea is facing around you know, the environmental issues around water, around, um, you know, the economy of the area. Uh, and I wonder if any of you can share some of deeper insights about how do you communicate across those barriers? Where often, for instance, the technical experts don't see and recognize community expertise or the community experts distrust, for instance, technical experts who don't know the region um, but may have some technical skills. So how do you overcome that? I guess I, I can start by kicking off, but I'm also interested to hear from, from all of my colleagues. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is very important in the work that we do is that when we come into a community, we know that we're only bringing in a very specific skill set and knowledge, but that it is really the community that should be shaping and moving the project forward, and that we are um, ready to do more learning than teaching. And I think that is ultimately where, where we find success in that when we are uh, starting a project in a new region, we need to do a lot of learning and, um, and that there is a lot of opportunity to enhance the technical skills that you already have. Um, this, I think, is a responsibility of professionals that are coming into a region and saying, hey, this is my job and this is what I'm going to do for you community. Um, it is our responsibility to come in from a place um, uh, of, of acknowledging that we don't know what we don't know. Um, and, and, and it is until then that we're able to say to the community, listen, you might be doing some learning, but I'm going to be doing probably more learning. And, and this is not about me bringing um, a, 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 a you know, list of solutions. This is about finding uh, a process and a set of solutions that work for you specifically, because no two communities are alike. We can look at presidents and we can look at examples of projects and similar uh, 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 issues that have gone, that have been solved or that are still underway. Um, but they're but they're not here. They're not they're not us. Uh, it is not the Salton Sea. And so, to me, it is really about that starting point of saying, look, we're kind of all learning here. But but we, the technical um, experts, are 
going to have to do the more learning because there's a lot of undoing that we need to do uh, in order to be able to provide a meaningful project. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'll just lift up one of the questions or comments from the audience was um, the importance of listening to questions and comments as much as sharing information. Frank, I see you have a comment on this too. Yeah, more, uh, please. thank you. Um, in addition to what my colleagues you know, are, uh, have already mentioned, a lot of the um, mistrust and and a lot of those gaps in between the technical expertise and the community expertise. And uh, I think a lot of it is due to uh, lack of exposure. Um, I spent a lot of time at the sea and I encountered so many people who know very little what is really going on. Right? So um, there has been very little efforts to really inform the community. This is what's really happening. Um, then we, we don't see a massive, you know, comms uh, effort to, to, to help people understand the basics of what is really happening. Most people think, you know, even in the research, you know, that we just completed around the community, the idea is, you know, that, that people have is that the lake is going to be cleaned up, the water is going to be cleaned up. So, so there is a lot of misinformation because, you know, people do not, the, the message is not percolating through all the different layers in the community. Uh, if you see most of the engagement uh, uh, meetings are attended by almost the same people, right? So we're missing a lot of different sectors because you were thinking of you know, the community as a monolith and it is not. We got so many different groups and subgroups and, and, and socioeconomic you know, uh, uh, variations of all the, 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 the groups you know, that, that, that live you know, uh, all around the communities around the sea. So I think at the end is, is, is failure to recognize how to inform the community, how to engage the community, how to allow people to participate. But at, at the end is, is is, is, is lack of putting that really uh, simple message that can allow people to grasp the basics and allow them to get engaged. People, even for some of us, you know, that do this as a living, it's gonna be difficult to understand the hydrological models and all the water models and all these and all that, those fancy, you know, terms. We need to understand that in order for to create the synergy, it needs to be done on both ends. We need to create bridges that allow us to learn from those for the community members and the community members to learn from us. But, it, and I think, you know, that is part of the process. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you raised that issue of the community as in a monolith, because I do want to come back to that and some of, the, some of the implications of that. But before I do, Miguel, I'd be really interested in, in your perspective of, of having worked both for, a, I mean, one of the people on the panel, not the only one, who's worked for a community organization and now for a public sector agency. But also, you know, I think this question of the communication across technical scientific issues and community expertise, I think seems to be particularly important in your position and the work you're doing. So I wonder about your perspectives on that. Yeah, I think, you know, that question requires a well thought answer. And, you know, it's, it's uh, definitely one of my goals uh, as a public affairs officer to make information as clear as possible to our audience or to you know folks that are, live in the region uh, or are interested in learning more about the the the, the SSMP efforts, right? So um, you know we have you know different groups of set of expertise. You know we have the science committee, we have the long range plan. Just recently, you know th those workshop that could be a little technical and just, you know, bringing it to a plain language uh, explanation. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit complicated. You know, it's, we wanna make sure that people understand what the project or what the proposed concepts are and what that really means and how they can um, help shape those proposed concepts. And this is just a, 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 an example, cause it's, it's, we have multiple efforts, but, you know, keeping it on the long range plan and, and those concepts that are out there, for review, um, you know how we how we communicate and how we present this information in a way that actually resonates in people's hearts and minds and how they're gonna live with this proposed concepts, right? Um, you know the, the 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 team, and I just want to you know be upfront with it. We just we have a, a pretty small team that works on 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 
proposing or we're developing these presentations. Uh, and we, again, we rely a lot on, on, on the engagement committee and this, the working groups to help us, you know, shape how we communicate these ideas, how we communicate uh, the concepts and how, okay, do we need a fact sheet? Do we need a, um, uh, you know, some type of um, educational piece that gets, gets disseminated before um, the meeting itself? I know for the for the this last meeting, uh, timing wasn't properly you know achieved, and you know documents were a bit late. We only provided a uh, maybe a day or two to folks to review these materials. So that's something that the, on the state's perspective, like we're working on um, to make that a priority, so we can get the you know information out timely, uh, let folks know about upcoming meetings in a timely way, so we don't you know just. Uh, Bring this uh, events, you know, out of out of the blue per se. It's just that we are actually being intentional how we communicate this information and how we present this, you know, technical information with all that technical jargon and and just presenting presenting all this information and in, again in a way that makes sense to community and resonates uh, with their quality of life and how they experience life at the sea. Thank Chris, you. Yeah. Um, if I can add um, just what I, some things that popped in my mind when I was listening to Christian and um, Frank on the topic of expertise. Um, so the, the, the main, uh, um, I think, challenge or investment to probably um, to address this is to invest in local expertise, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we do have the community expertise and then we have nonprofit organizations that have developed expertise in different um, capacities, right? And, and we see that. So for example, um, in the work that we do at the Salton Sea, we start with what are the community priorities? Um, how do they experience the sea? Let's understand that. But then we also, um, at Alianza, think about well, who has the capacity and the knowledge to help advance this, right? So um, in the partnership with KDI, for example, their expertise in um, one of them, one of their expertise in the planning and engineering world was they were a perfect partner for our salt and sea work. Um, Audubon and Sierra Club with their environmental um, focus, right? They were the perfect partner. So it really, and it goes back to the quote, right? That together we can do so little, I mean, alone we can do so little and together we can do so much. And that's really um, sort of Alianza's expertise, one of our expertise, right? It's like, how do we identify the need and how do we bring in the different um, experts and um, so that we can all be working together? And, and the other thing is that it's gotta be values driven. And I think um, there is this, disconnect that happens and that our region reacts to very negatively when there are experts coming from the outside to tell us how things are going to happen. Um, so ensuring that when we are um, engaging other community experts that we are aligned on our values and that um, that expert, the, the technical expertise does not carry more value than the lift experience expertise. Um, and then the other one um, on the topic of communication, which um, Frank brought up, the question about who is responsible, because he's right that we're not getting to all of the segments and that most of the nonprofit organizations that are here uh, because of our focus on equity, um, we target our resources to the communities that typically are left outside of any type of communication process. So the question again being who is responsible and if the state or any other agencies coming into my community to advance a project, should they not be responsible to do a blast everywhere, radio, PSAs, like look, this is what's happening, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about uh, the Salton Sea. Um, so just some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love your comments there. And part of it's, yeah, thinking about not just community engagement, but public accountability and, and what do we expect from our public agencies. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and just a reminder, if you have questions, please uh, submit them. I wanted to ask one more question um, that was sparked by your comments, Frank, about community is, is not a monolith, which is, 
how do we deal with conflict? Uh, people have different values, different ideologies, different experiences, different priorities. And we often um, have a hard time with difficult conversations. Uh, and it all too often in our society gets into conflict rather than difference becoming a source of, of strength and conflict moving to connection or resolution. And I'd just love to hear any of your experiences of productive conflict. How do we have those difficult conversations? How do we get across our differences? Frank? I want to just chime in because I raised, you know, the issue. <laughs> um, in my perspective, you know, and I come from uh, the mental health you know, background as well, uh, we tend to react when we, one, we don't get to know each other. And we, there is a distrust, like I think Sylvia mentioned, and it, people tend to react to the unknown. For those common grounds, as as long as we want to continue pushing our own agendas, okay, there is always going to be conflict because the other one across you know the uh, the, the table is also going to want to push you know his or his or her own agenda as well. So we need to be able to find those common grounds, and many times you know we need mediators to find those common grounds. But we need to find those common denominators that can allow us to build. We have common problems. We have a common problem in public health, right? We have a common problem in the environment that we are destroying. That you know, we have a common problem in, in the economic you know, issues that we're all facing. So we, there are a lot of common, you know, the common grounds. It is our inability to actually build on top of those common grounds that is drifting us, you know, to push in all different directions. Thank you. Christian? Yeah, the only thing that I, I just wanted to add, and I, th I think for us in this particular topic of consultancy, to me, it's a very simple uh, jumping off point, right? It's life and death. <laughs> really, it comes to that. Everyone that has a stake in it at all is uh, aware that no intervention, nothing being done is going to result in drastic public health outcomes. And so I think it's not the case for every topic. It's not the case for every issue, but I think it is the case for this particular issue. And I think when it comes to different priorities, different agendas, as Frank was mentioning, I think ultimately the, the, the point that needs to trump all priorities and all agendas is there are lives at stake. There are people's long-term health that is going to be affected. And, and if we don't have the sensibility and 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 the um, if we don't have the sensibility to understand that that is what should be priority, then you know I think it's a very other type of conversation that we need to be having. But to me, it's it's just very very simple um, that we do need to identify what voice, what priority should be top. Um, and I think when it comes down to environmental uh, problems, it's it's you know. Who's who's uh, who's gonna live through through all of this? Yeah, talk about an ultimate common ground. We all are mortal beings and breathe the same air. Uh, Mariella, I really like the term that you use, productive conflict. I think if there isn't conflict, then there's an issue because it means that you don't have diversity in the conversation, right? So I think conflict is not necessarily bad. It's it's just finding the respect and willingness to learn from each other to find a solution. And I wanted to also answer or give feedback on Casey's question. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's necessarily having to find common ground or prioritize one over the other. It's just acknowledging like community knowledge and community voices should be at the center because they know what their needs are. They know what is gonna like effectively work for their community and technical experience and technical expertise is a tool to answer those questions and to work together. But if you don't have that willingness to learn and have those productive conflict, then, then, then you're not gonna find a solution that, that works for the local community. Thank you. Sylvia? 
Yeah, Casey's question is really interesting. Um, and I, I mean, in my experience being involved, um, there is always, we can get to a point where there's a rational solution, I, I believe. Um, and I think the question becomes like, are, are we gonna do the right thing and what's within our means to do what's possible right now? Or am I looking for what I wanna see, right? Because I have an idea of what I may wanna see. Um, and that might be different from what Christian wants to see. Um, but ultimately what we want for this community is still the same thing, right? Um, so how do we have those conversations once we realize that we want the same thing and that there might be different ideas? It's just then a matter of ideas and finding which one is doable, right? Which one's going to get us there? Which one's going to advance us there? Um, and that's, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being a little too practical, um, but that's the approach. And the other thing also about it, the question of conflict, um, it is a very personal um, or individual sort of question. How do we show up in conflict, right? And, and I think that's what I can have control over myself, right? Like, how am I going to show up when there is conflict? And am I going to be, uh, you know, we all have different personality traits. Which one am I going to choose to be in, in this space? So that, again, we can advance um, and get to the underlying issue. I really believe conflict arises, and this is from my coaching training, um, it arises when people's needs are not being met. So what is the need that's not being met? How do we acknowledge it and recognize it and be able to step into that conflict as Maria says to result in a more uh, constructive um, dialogue and solution? Yeah, thank you for that. Well, we're almost out of time, but I wanna give each of you um, a last rapid round um, comment at the end. We'll go in the reverse order of when you presented, but um, maybe one suggestion is your um, favorite resource or best um, reference for people if they're interested in learning more about best practices in community engagement or about the work that you are doing. Um, so Miguel, I'll start with you, rapid last word. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And, and yeah, I just wanted to mention that perhaps keeping on, on the, the last conversation or piggybacking on some of you guys' points, you know, there's, it has to be this, you know, dialectic process of, you know, achieving a, you know, a, a, a consensus and how we want to see the future of the song see together, right? Um, and I'm there with you, you know, on a personal level and also on a professional level. So uh, definitely look forward to, you know, keeping the good work going uh, for our community. Um, and also just, you know, to let folks know or people want to be more informed about the song scene management program, uh, a great way to be kept up to date is to, uh, hop on into our listserv, uh, you know, just go to the songc.ca.gov website. There's a, a link, a hyperlink that you can subscribe to our listserv. Uh, we try to get one, at least one every other week. Um, if more, uh, that, that's great, but at least one every other week so we can share what we're working on and project updates, uh, upcoming meetings. So, and also as a basis, if you want to learn more about the, the um, Sansi management program, you know, there's the tenure plan, uh, there's, you know, some good informational pieces that I have a sort of a um, concise version of the tenure plan. And there's, a, a you know, good resources out there, uh, you know, that our partners have put together. So, um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity again. Great. Thank you. Frank, last words. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all. And thank you for all the attendees, you know, that um, stay with us all this, you know, um, about an hour and a half. I wouldn't be an honor banner out of honor if I do not use um, a bird, you know, phrase. And I like to use, you know, this phrase um, that birds are usually good indicators of how good or how bad your environment is. And at the Southern Sea, the environment is getting rather bad. That we lost over thirty-five percent of the species of the four hundred, you know, that used to come to the Southern Sea. Um, and we are the uh, brink of a major ecological collapse. And my, so my question is, we, I mean, the birds and the wildlife are learning how difficult, you know, the life is uh, at the Southern Sea. 
can we learn from the uh, from the birds and the wildlife and and learn how to find those common grounds to come together um i think you know the uh, the wildlife is teaching us a lot and we often forget that we're part of the larger ecosystem uh so i, I say let's just pay attention to what is happening to them because we're next listen to the birds christian uh it's actually in 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 a been in response to Casey's question from earlier, and that uh, technical expertise is in the service of community. And that's really how we should be thinking about um, when we're going out and, and, and implementing projects, for example, with the community is all of these expertise, all of these technical um, uh, resources should be in the service of communities. Because what we all want is for a successful project is uh, to, to increase uh, uh, life expectancy, uh, quality of life. These are sort of the shared goals from everyone, from a private, you know, from, from a government to the nonprofits to the individual community member. And so I think it's, it's really about uh, understanding that we have tools that are, are available um, to us through various different ways. Um, how are they uh, in, in service of the community? And 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 just very last, I'm going to add my our website. Um, you know that the, the uh, uh, you can check out some of the projects that we've done um, both here in the U.S. and out uh, in in Africa. And it's really that idea that community can be a real partner in the decision making of projects um, that are being led by state agencies. And so. Um, if you get a chance, uh, check out our website. Okay, thank you. Sylvia? Yes, um, my, I will restate one of my key points or takeaways, um, which was that, that we all have a role to play. The issues that are impacting our communities are intersectional in nature. We cannot think of jobs in one lane and the environment in another lane and engagement in another lane. Um, it requires really all of us. Um, and I think it's not until we realize that, right, that we're going to start to shift um, the way and the approach in which we do our work. And um, so you asked about a resource and um Chris tomorrow and I want to uh, put a plug in for your um book um which is solidarity economics um which I think would be a great resource for how is it you know what it requires how do we transform this idea that it's all about a, a competition versus this integrated approach and centering community um, first, and then tomorrow we are going to both be participating in a workshop and I couldn't find the flyer um, to give the information, but we're participating in a workshop with the um, California Energy Commission where Chris and I will go into a little more detail on our salt and sea initiative, which I used as an example, and Chris will go into the framework of the solidarity economics and the indicators um, that make sense for a region, and this is happening hybridly, so if you are here, you can go to um, the Imperial Valley College, or you can join via Zoom. Um, so those are the resources that I'll leave. Thank, Thank you, you for that, Sylvia, including plugging our book, um, which is available for free, actually, to download. That's our um, sign of solidarity with our, our readers. There's also comic book versions of it as well. Uh, Mariella, the last word to you before turning it back to Michael to close us out. Yeah, I think for me, it would just go full circle back to my presentation as well, where your best resource, I think, would be the community, because again, you need to know from the community how to engage with that community. So just practice and invest because a community engagement is not like Sylvia said earlier, it's not just a check mark. It's not just a requirement. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of energy. It requires a lot of respect and kindness, right? So acknowledge that, acknowledge that it's going to require a lot of work um, and learn from community. So that would be my resource. Perfect last words. Um, Michael, I'll turn it back to you to close this out. Um, well, I just want to thank you, Chris, for an uh, excellent job moderating and the panelists for a very robust and informative conversation. Uh, and to the participants who joined us and posed a number of interesting questions. 
Uh, just a reminder that this webinar was recorded. We'll post it up on our website, packins.org uh, slash videos uh, in the next couple of days, recorded in English and in Spanish. So both versions should be available uh, and encourage people to, to share that link. Um, again, this is the fourth in a series of webinars we're hosting on various salt and sea related topics. Uh, the other videos are already posted up there and more to come. Uh, and if people have ideas for future webinars, please go ahead and send them to me, mcohen at packinst.org, and I'll go ahead and, and organize those as well. Uh, again, thanks to everyone, and thanks to Carlos for interpreting this, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks, all. <laughs>